there you go. Just get this out of the way. Uh, couple of you said there's a bit of crunching in the sound earlier, so it wasn't me eating a sweet or something. Uh, but let me just test that. How's that? It's okay. All good? All right. So, what quenches our thirst? Coca Cola! Sorry, you Pepsi lovers over there. I can see Hayden and his face has just dropped. Every generation here has seen a Coca-Cola advert. The first printed advert was in 1890 with the slogan, refreshing and invigorating. Uh, this is an early example. Uh, the first uh, TV commercial was in 1950. And through the ages, the message is pretty much the same, isn't it? Coca-Cola, it's the real thing. It will quench your thirst. And I will admit, on a hot day, there's plenty of those in Perth, or when I need an energy boost, I will drink a Coca-Cola. The advertising works. But we all know it's just a short fix. Uh, it satisfies us for just a moment, and then we need it again and again. Now, we just had the reading of the text from uh, John, uh, where we see the claim of Jesus as the ultimate thirst quencher. And there are two main things that come out of the text, uh, the invitation of Jesus and the effect of Jesus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word, your life-giving word, your word that quenches our thirst. Lord, by revealing your word to us, you reveal the answer to our thirst by dwelling amongst us. Heavenly Father, may your word inspire us today to keep our focus on the true living water that is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. And I pray for anyone attending today who may not, not yet know who you are, that their questions would be answered and that they too would say yes to Jesus as Lord and as Saviour. And it's in his name that we pray. All right, so let's have a look at the beginning of verse 37. It says there in bold, on the last and greatest day of the festival. So what uh, festival was this? Well, if we look back earlier in John chapter 7, in verse 2, it says it was the Jewish festival of tabernacles, which was near. And then in John 14, it says not until halfway through the festival did Jesus go up to the temple court and begin to teach. So this was the festival of tabernacles. Uh, Levitical, uh, sorry, our Leviticus reading from earlier, from Kieran. Thanks, Kieran. Uh, so that talked about this festival. It lasted for about a week, and it was also known as the festival of booze. Now for this festival, God commanded his people to build uh, temporary shelters out of palm branches and some other uh, trees and live in them for a week. And so this is what they would have looked like. Well, I mean, that's a cartoon version, but you get the point. And um, when the people slept in these booths, which they would have done during that week, they would have seen the stars through the gaps uh, of the palm trees, reminding them of the majesty of God. Now, these booths, um, you know, they had three walls, and then kind of like a, a partial wall on the sides there. And this would represent three things. And so the first uh, thing it would have represented, it would have represented God hugging his people and providing for them. Secondly, the temporary structures represented the temporary situation of God's people in a temporary world. And thirdly, the booths represented an open invitation to guests who may come and dwell with God and his people. And so Jews at this time would invite guests to come and eat with them. Other things would happen too, like uh, the Jews would uh, buy these plants and kind of wind them up together. And by this 
uh, citrus fruit, which looks a bit like a lemon. And what they would do is they would rub them together and that would create uh, like a, a bit of an aroma that would fill the booth and that would represent the presence of God. So in these booths, uh, people would also uh, put up pictures of loved ones and they would put up lights up on them as well, like we do at Christmas time or in our, our frescoes. Now, this was like a week-long uh, glamping trip with lots of celebration, uh, living in community with believers, and the opportunity to invite guests to take part in eating lots of delicious food. You know me, I would love that sort of thing. Now, Jews from all over the world would come to Jerusalem for this. This was one of those uh, pilgrim festivals. And in Jesus' time, it is estimated that there would be up to a million Jews in Jerusalem attending. Now, on the last day, uh, the greatest day of the festival, uh, what would happen is a priest would uh, come out of the temple uh, holding a golden jug. Now, the church budget doesn't stretch that far, but you get the fine. Now, what he would do was he would walk out of the temple and he would go to the pool of Salem, fetch some water, and then come back. And the crowd would follow him and then come back to the temple. And what he would do in front of a large crowd, he would then pour out the water in front of the altar. And so what this represented was the people thanking God for the provision of rain from the past year and for the petition of rain for the year ahead. Now, up to this moment throughout the week and in this event, there would have been a lot of chatting, uh, a lot of noise, a lot of dancing, a lot of praising God. There would have been a lot of singing, singing the Psalms and singing uh, verses from Isaiah. Now, we had the, uh, the Rospit twins uh, last week singing song after song, and so it would have been a lot like that, a lot of celebrating. But when the water was poured out, the whole place with a million Jews would have fallen into silent contemplation. It would have been like the World Cup final when the referee blows his whistle for a minute's silence to remember someone who had passed away. Contemplation. Here, the Jews were thinking about God. They are thinking about the celebrations of the past week. They are thinking about uh, God's provision. And they are thinking about the future promised to Messiah. And then, Jesus stood up and cried out, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. This is the invitation of Jesus, point one. So what Jesus was saying here, first and foremost, is that the festival, by saying this, he's linking it to him. He's saying the festival is about him. He is the tabernacle of God. He is God who has come to dwell with his people. And Jesus uses the imagery of the water pouring ceremony to say that he is the living water, the promised Messiah that God has poured out, which quenches the thirst of the people. Before in uh, John's Gospel, uh, Jesus was amongst his people. He had performed signs, he had done miracles, he was teaching, and indeed he taught earlier at this festival. And the people, some of the people were talking about him leading up to this moment. And some were saying things like, in verse 12, he is a good man. In verse 15, how did this man get such learning without having been taught? And in verse 31, many in the crowd believed in him, they said, when the Messiah comes, will he perform more signs than this man? So some at the festival were already believing in Jesus up to this point. And by Jesus saying that the festival is about him, it links right back to the beginning of the Gospel of John. In chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, 
and the Word was God. And then in verse 14 it said, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. Now, uh, it, the Greek word for dwelling there that you see in verse 14 is the word skene, which means to pitch a tent and to dwell in it. You remember the original tabernacle, right? It was a temporary tent where God would dwell with his people whilst they were in the wilderness. What was the festival celebrating? The festival of tabernacle. Dwelling. The booze. A time when God will again dwell with his people. I mean, that's why the people were celebrating it. But they no longer needed the shadow, because that's what those festivals were, a shadow of what was to come, for the real thing, the Messiah, the refresher and invigorator of our souls, had arrived. And all the people have to do is to come to Jesus and drink. They just had to believe in him. That's the link. He is the first quencher that the people were looking for. Now, I happen to think that along with uh, a million Jews at this time, there probably would have been some uh, Roman soldiers uh, maybe keeping an eye on this, uh, the guys that occupied uh, Israel at the time. And big events like this, well, you know, the Romans, they were very well organized and they did not trust the people that they ruled over. And so just like a World Cup final, I reckon there would have been crowd controllers, you know, like stewards, uh, just keeping an eye on things to make sure a fight or a war doesn't break out. Now, when Jesus said these things, it said in verse 37, involved there that he stood up and said these things in a loud voice. The fact that he stood up um, as a rabbi was counter to how rabbis taught. Uh, they would normally teach from a sit-down position, but here Jesus was standing up. And he also said what he said in a loud voice. Now, in the Greek, the loud voice comes from the word krasso. Uh, krasso means cried out. So it's kind of similar, isn't it? Krasso, cried out. And when someone is speaking loudly, okay, sure, um, they are speaking louder like this. But when someone is crying out, what springs to mind? It's pleading. It's emotional. It's, uh, it's a loud voice that is requiring a response. And it's like when, when someone is injured and no one is nearby, it's not just going to be a loud voice, help me, help me. It's going to be more like, help me. It's going to be very distressed. But when Jesus was shouting here, it's not a cry for help. It's more like a war cry for the people to realize that he is the long-awaited saviour. That he is God dwelling with them. Believe in me. Jesus was preaching here. Remember Max said a few weeks ago that preaching is pleading. And Jesus was pleading for his people to respond, to believe that he is the real thing. This is spiritual warfare going on. And so I think a lot of the Jews would have heard Jesus, but maybe some Roman soldiers too. Oh, hang on, what's that guy shouting about over there? They may have thought. Don't forget the first person who came to faith when Jesus died at the cross was a Roman centurion, right? Maybe he was at the festival that day, and this was the first time he heard about Jesus. I don't know. It's just a thought. But what we do know is that the invitation to believe in Jesus goes far and wide. It goes to Jews and Gentiles. It goes to those who believe God and those who don't believe God. It goes to all those who are religious and those of other religions, and who are not religious at all. 
It goes to all those who thirst for the truth, whether they realise it or not. The call goes to every image bearer across the world to respond to Jesus, to believe in him and have their thirst quenched. Most of us know this very famous verse in John chapter 3. You pretty much say it almost every week. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So anyone saying that Jesus is Lord and believe that he died for our sins, raised from the dead, that he is the son of God, indeed God himself will have eternal life. And if you are here today, and you are thirsty, and you tried other things and they have not worked, you tried other religions and they have not worked, you tried experiences and they have not worked, you tried a new identity and that has not worked, you tried anything and everything the world has to offer you and it has not worked. Maybe today is the day that you hear Jesus crying out to you, are you hearing Jesus pleading for you to respond? Are you hearing his offer to quench your thirst? You may be a first-time visitor, or you may have been here for years. Jesus says, believe in me, and your thirst will be quenched. Come and drink, and you will never thirst again. For those of us who have responded and followed Jesus, as many of us here have done, uh, we will be with God in his kingdom forever. And so if the only thing you get from today's sermon is the reminder of the majesty of Jesus Christ, just like the gaps in the palm trees, and that remind you of the glory of God and how he has quenched your thirst with the living water that overflows, then praise God. This brings me to point two, the effect of Jesus. And this is what we get in verse 38. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Now grab your Bibles with me and go to John chapter 4. Um, if you don't have your Bibles, that's okay. You can just follow on along to my voice. So John chapter 4, and from verse 4, it says this. Now he, Jesus, had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. <laughs> Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was on the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Let me pause just there. So as you can see in this text, the Jews and the Samaritans normally did not mix. Uh, the Samaritans were Jews, but they mixed their beliefs with the ones found in Samaria. And it has become a syncretized religion, hence they were called the Samaritans. So the Jews and Samaritans did not mix at all, not for uh, religion, not for business, and not for pleasure. But here, Jesus, a Jew, asked a Samaritan woman, a woman from a different religion, for a drink. Let's carry on from verse 10. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. 
Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Let me pause there. So here, uh, Jesus has now said, pretty much, that the woman's thirst has not been quenched by physical water. It's not being quenched by having many partners. It's not being quenched by religion. The conversation has turned to spiritual matters. Uh, let's carry on, but, um, on verse 21. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know, we worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming, when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Fascinating. Do you see how uh, Jesus invited this woman from another religion to believe in him? He did not argue with her. He did not judge her. He stated facts and truths regarding salvation that had now the truth was in front of her. He stated truth that true worshippers will worship in spirit and in truth, pretty much from anywhere. He stated the truth that he is the Messiah, that he is the living water, and that believing in him will finally quench her thirst. This is how Jesus interacted with someone from a different worldview. For a start, he initiated the conversation with a simple request, can I have a drink, please? And the Samaritan woman, she was so surprised that Jesus was talking to her because the Jews would have nothing to do with the Samaritans because of their differences. The Jews for the Samaritans were too far gone, that they were out of reach. Are we guilty of thinking that others are too far gone, like uh, the Mormons or the Muslims, that we don't even say hello? Jesus didn't think that. And when he spoke with the Samaritan woman, he didn't argue about her religion. He didn't judge her for her life choices. Of course, he did not agree with them, but he took the conversation to what was important, the destiny of her soul. He stated the truth about salvation and presented the Messiah himself, just simple gospel truth. And then what happened to the Samaritan woman? Well, she became one of the greatest evangelists recorded in the scriptures. She believed in Jesus and witnessed to her town. And look at the reaction of the Samaritans in uh, verse 42. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this man really is the saviour of the world. The word of Jesus. See for yourself. The Samaritan woman just presented him. This is the effect of the gospel. The gospel, well, it first comes to us 
the gospel then overflows so that others hear about the living waters of Jesus Christ and how and see how he quenches their thirst. I mean, that's the whole point of why the Gospel of John was written. If you look at chapter 20, verse 30 to 31, it says, Jesus performed many of the signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. The word was written to be read. When the Samaritan woman believed, springs of living water overflowed from a heart that was so thankful for being saved. From being at the well of Jacob to get a drink that would quench her thirst for a moment, she got the living waters of Jesus that satisfied her soul for all eternity. Then the streams of living water went from Jacob's well and flooded into the town. She lived out the gospel, shared her testimony about Jesus, and others checked him out and came to faith. This is the overflowing effect of Jesus. It's been happening for the last 2,000 years. Uh, Jesus said in 8.12, I am the last of the world. And at the festival, uh, Jerusalem would have been lit up, that would have been seen for miles. But the gospel light of Jesus Christ has been shining upon Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, including Perth. I was at a World Cup match last night, and there was Panama versus Jamaica. And Panama, uh, they lost, they went out of the World Cup, but several of their play players got on their knees and they prayed and thanked Jesus. It's even gone to Panama. I don't even know where Panama is, do you? And just like the appointment of the Samaritan woman, Jesus, oh God, yeah, Jesus is arranging all sorts of appointments for people to hear the truth today. We heard in our uh, teaching time earlier that God has decreed everything before he even created the world. And so God decreed the meeting between Jesus and the Samaritan woman, and he has decreed all our appointments with the people that come across our paths. So when you get those moments where the conversation turns to spiritual things, just share the truth of who Jesus is. Share the gospel. You'd be surprised at how many Australians enjoy spiritual conversations, and some, some will check out Jesus for themselves. We are not to think that anyone is too far gone, not the Muslim, not the Mormon, not the Buddhist, not the atheist, not anything else. Every single person on this earth is an image bearer of God. And no matter what religion they are in, what worldview that they are identified as having or how they are living their lives, they need their thirst quenched by the saviour of their souls. And this river of living water has been flown from one person to another, another drafting in people from many tribes and tongues, many religions and worldviews, and will continue to do so until Jesus comes back to judge the living and the dead. The invitation goes out to all. Jesus is the one who is refreshing and invigorating. He is the true first quencher of souls across the world. And the effect of the gospel is overflowing. Jesus is the real thing. He is the one who saves. And so what is your response? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the Lord God and that you don't change your mind on us and that you sent your, Jesus, your son Jesus to be the light that shines across the whole world and that the gospel has even reached Perth. Oh, thank you that this light shines and that people check out their this light and some do come to know who you are, Lord. 
Lord, we are not the saviour of people, but you are. But you called us to be bold in those moments when the conversations go towards a spiritual angle, Lord, to just share the truth of who you are and allow people to check you out for themselves. Mm -hmm. That they too may come to know who you are as well, Lord. And so, Lord, help us to trust in this. Help us to trust that many more will come to know who you are in this generation, in the next, and the next. Or whenever you come back, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we can trust in your word. Thank you for you, Lord, and for your mercy and grace towards us that we too have responded to this. And for anyone who is here, who is responding to this call this morning to believe in you, we thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.